don't know if you've ever heard of the saying, make hay whilst the sun shines. <laughs> um, I just mowed the lawn for three days straight, eh? And you'll be thinking, are you mad? Look, I'm not saying I'm an opportunist, but, you know, it's a farming rule of thumb. You've got to make hay whilst the sun shines. So, no need to make hay with the decision that we made with the pivots. Just grow good feed and feed the cattle. But with the lawns, um, look, it's been raining for over a month. And I've got a feeling as of tomorrow, it's going to continue to rain for another month. Unreal, hey? They're saying mid-April. Anyway, um, I'd like to think that maybe it slows down. Um, maybe it won't. We'll see. But, um... Well, I haven't mowed in about a month. I know that's funny. Like, not properly. I mean, I've done around the house and around the, um, the electric fest boundaries and stuff like that, but not a proper mow, like... I just mowed the driveway, I mowed the fire trails, um, mowed up around the factory, I made the entire hill lot, like, i have done, I've mowed, um, everything. So I was like, today was kind of like the cutoff date for reasonable weather, because like, where I live, look, even in the middle of the summer, this is the annoying thing, like this year, you can't use a ride-on mower till about 11.30 because um, bloody moisture is still in the grass. So what you have to do is jump on the tractor and use the um, the big mowing deck. So the mowing deck I've got on that's 3.4 metres wide. It's exactly the width of a gate. So when I want to go out the front gate, I have to turn around in reverse and slowly, gently nudge, and there's like one or two millimetre either side, and I get through the front gate. It's unreal. Anyway, um, it's fascinating. Like, well, I wonder what others have done with their time whilst it's been raining, or oh, whilst it's been sunning, sorry. In yeah, three days sun, did they go to the beach? What did they do? Who knows? Anyway, um, let's get to the topic of this video. Look, you know, like, you, like, keep your eyes peeled, you may see something. For me, it's keep your ears peeled, you may hear something. And, yeah, typically, um, yeah, keep your ears and eyes open. Yeah. And it'll be a word, a simple word word and it'll make sense to a conundrum that you've been trying to articulate the kaleidoscope on to get a deeper meaning of you know revelations epiphanies um like for example i was trying to figure out like you know uh the you know the acts of narcissism you know like i hate to say even some of the bullshit that you know we had to endure growing up and whatnot it's like you know, what what's this common denominating trait and uh, it was just watching this movie, Full Metal Jacket, and I just picked up the DVD case, and you know, there's a slight bit of humour in the introduction, in one sense because he's uh, he knows how to crack the whip, that drill sergeant. Um, but what it said on the DVD, you know, how dehumanisation happens. Oh, I was like, boom, there it is dehumanization that's just pretty much sums up the acts of egotism in a nutshell how did it dehumanize something enough create an enemy out of it so you can treat it like shit and not have a conscience about um, how you need to be feeling for the fact that you may have done something that you know, if you had a conscience you wouldn't have done it yeah anyway, so dehumanization isn't that interesting anyway um Without even knowing it, this afternoon, <laughs> don't you love having cats that come for a walk? They don't need to be on a lead, nothing at all. 
and they'll come with me all the way up the driveway. They walk with us, walk with me wherever we choose to go. I have bought a baby sling to go on the front of me though. My little white one, Boz, he likes to be carried at times. But, but he's that big that he gets heavy on your arms. So I'm going to get the sling and he can sit in the sling like a front backpack. And yeah, speaking, don't you spoil them. But look, to be honest with you, it's bonding with the animal. I love the animal. But yeah, it was the same reason why I jumped on the lawnmower as well. I will typically only walk where I have mown. So it's funny when you make commitments that are good for self-love, how you will buy things to enhance that experience. I think it's chicken soup with the soul carrying the cat whilst I walk up the driveway. Yeah, and I think he enjoys it too because he likes going for a walk and he doesn't mind being carried when you walk. It's fascinating because most cats can't cope with it. Him? I've got a special bond with him. I saved his life when he was like four weeks old and just ever since then he's just like, yep, that's me dad. You know? Back to it. So, words. I do apologise apologize if it's windy. I think the prince of the pair of the air likes to try and intervene with these conversations. In Jesus Christ's name, may that be put to rest now so that we can you know, do this free of wind so we can actually you know, get to where we need to go. So I was listening to a video and just of all the topics it was just you know, it was talking about narcissism that's not everything that i listen to it's just you know things have got their rounds and at the moment for whatever reason it's sadistic narcissist fascinating anyway um and not just one it's coming in from left right and center so i don't know if that's what's the on the psyche of the collective at the moment not quite sure but um I'd hate to say we're going around the, mer the merry-go-round and it's just the same old stuff from a different perspective. Look, it's it's beyond that. Um, but there's hints of being the merry-go-round at the same time. Just, you know, say, so deeper understandings. What is it, like a shell? You know, the Fibonacci code, how it just keeps expanding and the understanding grows greater as we get deeper introspection with our awareness. Anyway, um, this video is for any empath out there um, look I had a bastard of an experience growing up you know be like yeah I am not belittling how I got bored up I'm not belittling that it's not that it's just we live in a world with broken sick people pretty much everyone's broken and sick are they not Anyway, with um, growing up, I remember it got really, really, really bad in grade seven. And from grade seven onwards, I have pretty much hated being alive. Look, life's got better uh, only pu purely through the incessant need to continually survive by going deeper and deeper and deeper and enhancing and enhancing and enhancing and there gets to a point where you become bigger better smarter faster harder greater and you are no longer affected by the simple mediocrity that once literally ruined your very existence and i hated being a teenager i hated my 20s i remember getting to the age of 30 thinking Fuck, I'm glad those 30 years are dead. Um, it's only been these last few years. Oh, when? You know, like, you got the end of the beginning, the beginning and the end. I, I, am, I am a chosen one. And I'm telling you right now, like, my life was written before I was born. And all the preparations were already in place before I came here. And it's unbelievable, the idiosyncrasies. And like, that's why I, I, I do not willfully try to control my reality 
because God not only knows what's best for me, but um, I find it very hard to argue with what what gets presented to me, because I'm just like, obviously, God knows you better than you know yourself. You are God. God is you. You know, like you one one and the same thing. We all are that. You know. Um, we are children. You know? Flourished seeds. Like a grape tree. Anyway. Um, it was only once I got past a certain level of testing. So I'm going to be really clear. I had like a spiritual awakening when I was 24, 25. And it was the best experience of existence itself. There is nothing that will ever come close to what that is. It's like being a human super saiyan. It's fantastic. Anyway, it wasn't time to keep that energy though, unfortunately. Where I had to first of all get over the fact that it felt like I was addicted to chasing that experience once more. Because lo and behold, wouldn't you guess it, I got locked up. I felt like one of the X-Men, and um, they drugged me accordingly and nearly killed me. And um, that is what it is. That was 10 years ago. I feel like a major part of my journey in this life is I've gone through it so others won't have to. Major part of it. You know, back to it. Um, we haven't even got to the point of the topic, huh? So... I was listening to something today to do with sadistic narcissism. This aspect has nothing to do with them because, you know, it's just psychopathic by nature. But it's something that... Oh, I'm going to have a look at nuances. I'm going to have a look at the nuances of it. But just to dissect it for what it is to give anyone that may have gone through this... So I'm going to look at this. It's like a first aid kit for Empress. Right? Um... It's, it's unfortunately why I've cut many people out of my life without knowing like the main reason for it. But once I heard it, this is why, you know, the years pricking, it's like, shit, that's what I've been trying to find. You know, key words, key things to understand. Um, it showed me why I had a like, not like bitter, bitter resent, but just... I couldn't stand to be around particular people, but at the same time, as you're going through your healing process, you keep, it's like you're going, I like hitting my head against brick walls, it feels good. Anyway, um, haven't done that in a while, and just seems since I've, I've like, you know, am I healed? Pretty much. And it's just funny, <clears throat> I'm saying like the hindsight of things, because I am, for the most part, healed now, the answers that I would never have found, because I wasn't healed, are just you know just popping up left right and center like flowers and that is what's happening at the moment it's like i'm in the spring of healing it's fascinating now um you ready for it narcissists hunt apologetic people One more time. I heard this earlier. It was just a fleeting word coming out of someone's mouth and it hit me and I was like, oh my gosh. Narcissists are on the hunt for apologetic people. One more time. Narcissists are on the hunt for apologetic people. Yeah, worry wards, people that are always sorry. It's interesting, isn't it? An overdeveloped conscience a flogged dog, someone with a doormat on, you know, you, you know what I'm talking about, if you're an empath, you know exactly what the hell I'm talking about here, it is very interesting, and as we start to dissect this, these creatures that are on the lookout for apologetic people are unapologetic by nature. They are very unapologetic. They're very deliberate with their actions. And they will flame shift every time you try to bring up the topic and have a conversation about where things stand and who should be responsible for what. Look, 
I think you listening to my jargon for the first 11 minutes will have just paid for itself now that we just spoke about that for the last two minutes, you know? Has that not just resonated and rang a few bells? I would think so. Maybe that's the gift I received for um, mowing my lawn for three days. A revelation. Hey? Anyway, as I get them, I'll pass them to you also. So, um, where are we at now? There's an apple here. Narcissists are on the hunt for worry warts. Oh, they love a worry wart. Sorry, sorry, sorry. They want someone that cringes to their beckoning will. They are selfish individuals, but they are full of self-loathing. So with the self-loathing that they struggle to deal with because they like to try and be a big fish in a small pond, they will create realities for themselves where they will hurt someone, but through hurting them, they will manipulate it and blame shift for as if the person that they hurt, that person was the one whose fault it was. So they create this addictive pattern where the abusee, the um, poor old masochist, if you want to say that, um, feels like they're to blame for the narcissist taking out their malignant garbage on them. Yeah? Victim. There it is. But, you know, we've got the life of the victim, the villains, and the heroes. Yeah, that's why we've got the, the hero's journey. Um, it's funny. I completed that a few years ago, huh? Fascinating journey, that one. Um... But again, it's only once you realize that you know that you just don't know that the answers to life really start to come. You know? So this is all about victims, villains and, her villains and heroes. It's just where you'll really start to get to the next level in life is you don't want to be a victim. You don't want to be a villain. Look, it's all right being a hero for a, for a time, but that hero is to try and... Um, how can I say this? Essentially make up for how we feel so bad about who it is we are within our existence. Like, we can't accept our shortfalls. So we have to do something to, uh, there it is, diversional therapy, essentially. That was me, seven years straight in the gym, six days a week. Unbelievable, eh? I put on 45 kilos and I was strong as an ox. It was unbelievable. But um, ultimately, it's because I was avoiding the fact that I just did not feel good enough. And what was interesting is it was through lifting weights that I conquered my hero's journey. It's fascinating. There seems to be a limit that we push through. There's a, a window, and once we've gone through it, we've hit potential inevitability of our destiny. You know, back to it. A narcissist loves an apologetic person. Now, when you've got a direct deliberate narcissist you know they're not sorry they're just sorry that you found out let's be clear about that but um so by nature they're slave drivers and they love to crack the whip they love to dehumanize see how it's coming back into the other word dehumanization so they want to dehumanize you they want to discipline you because they feel like they're the master and they feel like you're the slave that's on a chain and you must wield to their beckoning wheel whim you know like just it's it's just yeah slave driving it's just old brutal ego mentality that's been around for eons and you know we're just we're polishing out of existence now but they can't kick it they feel like that those ways of old those old dog ways that um they're they're still valid there's no validity in them no right. so a deliberate narcissist will be very direct about the fact that they love to crack the whip and um, how dare you, you know, how dare you, <laughs> how dare you tell me not to do it. It's just like, well, um, so it's not lawful that you do what you do and if you keep going, we may have to put you in jail, hey? There's that one. So for them, there's a bit of a reality check. 
all right? But it's the, there's one that I want to really, really hit home on here that we need to hear about. You've got the ones that are all out there loud and proud. It's like, yep, they're an out of the closet narcissist, loud and proud. Look at me. I'm the center of the universe. I am a worthless piece of shit. I will control you. I hate my life, but inflicting pain on you gives me some relief from the fact that my very existence sucks. Nonetheless, so you've got those ones. Let's get to the ones that you don't see. And it's only because I was having a conversation with someone today. Uh, look, I unfortunately had to do what Abraham did. And that is um, walk. And walk into my new life with no one. And it's funny it was because there's something that I didn't see with those that I thought I should bring with me into this new life. And it's only now that it's fully surfaced and it was on a subconscious level that I could see it. And um, the issue you've got is you won't realize it until you recognize your own behavior about the interaction itself. All right? Apologetic people. A narcissist loves to pick a flaw out in you and to chip away at it, even if what they've got is 10 times worse because it helps to make them feel better about themselves. Remember that. But um, let's talk about the passive-aggressive narcissist. Let's talk about the low-key haters. These are the ones that you never saw coming. And this is where I found myself cutting pretty much everyone off once I saw it you know, kind of for what it is. So the low-key hater, you don't realize it, but um, as you're speaking to them, they're trying to frame you into a reality. They're trying to box you in to a diminished state. And if you say anything that doesn't you know, meet what they are going to state as their own perfection whilst you're having the conversation, they will be snappy all of a sudden. And if they can get you to become apologetic, boom, they've got you on your toes. See that dominant submissive shit? Anyway, that's why I, I, I don't speak to my family anymore. Yeah. Where's the common respect? You know? Where's the unconditional love? Like, where's the... It's, it's a case of they'll love you as long as you do, do everything their way. Have a good life. Um, unfortunately, they didn't do enough in my life for me to miss them. And I hate that. I just, I wish that they had a bit more heart. I wish that they were a bit more caring and compassionate. But at the same time, we're all broken, sick people, you know? So today wasn't family, it was just someone else, uh, as a mate of all things. And it's something that I've been pinpointing for a while, but it's very low key and I couldn't quite see it until I grabbed it. And um, they're happy to talk to you as long as it's on their terms and only when they want to. See what I mean? They're all in control. So, unfortunately, I probably won't speak to them again now. And you'd be like, fuck, you're going to end up with no one. It's like, that's correct. Because I don't really like being human. I don't like being on Earth. And if I have to walk this planet with my pets and if god decides to bring decent people of integrity in my life i'll have a friend or two but i'd rather have no one than this sick satanic shit snake ridden viper pit fucking control freaks but at the same time they're that fucking useless that they can't do anything to provide for you because i've got the fucking opportunity <laughs> you see? So they hate the fact that you've got the opportunity because they're always in fucking competition with you. And God has an opportunity for them, but guess what they've got to do? Fucking humble up. Anyway, so this is just for any empath out there. If you find yourself and don't associate as being a fucking empath, we are empathetic, right? And having empathy is the key to the next level. 
Because if you can stand into the feet of, the, of another and see the world through their eyes, have you not got outside of yourself so you can see yourself also too? Empathy. That's what they're trying to kill off. Because if you've only got, you know, exterior vision instead of being able to look within, you know, the world stays mediocre in this snake-driven vibers pit. So empathy is the key to raising the awareness and frequency and consciousness on this planet. It is. So we play a vital role here as empaths. Um, nonetheless, so if you say something to someone without, you know, and yeah, like you're, you're, you're always trying to be the best version of yourself and um, you're not trying to overstep the mark in a sense where you want to be, um, how do I say, rude but just um again unapologetic that could be it i, I love these hills and trees oh, aren't they lovely anyway so yeah you're just trying to be genuine you're trying to just create decent conversation all the rest of it um if you feel like even though you weren't really thinking that you were doing it but you've said something and it, it offends that person but it and, and it but or they act offended about what you have said, and then all of a sudden you feel that you've become apologetic, but they don't want to say anything, boom, get rid of them. Fucking low-key narcissists. See, what we've got to do is we've got to annihilate every last narcissist within our existence. They don't need to be near us. We need to heal. We need to move to the next level of our life. I bet you there's... um gang gangs up in that tree because the leaves are falling everywhere at the moment and it's not natural yeah there we go i don't know if you see it can you see the gang gang it's a, it's a rare cockatoo well, hopefully you can see him just So um, you've got to become a bit ruthless about tolerances. So essentially, it's a very good thing to learn how to ghost people. But not just ghost people, it's a very good thing to become allergic. So <clears throat> you'll make that decision to become allergic to this bullshit when you commit to the decision that you will not be a scapegoat to any asylum again. I will never receive the blame from anyone again without them having to look in the mirror and be responsible for their own actions. I don't want to deal with irresponsible people. I am sick of it. So, one more time, narcissists are on the hunt for people that love to say sorry the worry wart um the servants essentially uh but they're more like slaves and yeah, uh up at the manor of the house of the lady that i serve the lady that i'm a knight to she's lovely absolutely lovely like that's why i serve and protect so well because like it you know You'd give your life for them. And well, that's the point though. We choose our lady and I'll be her night until her grave, which is what it is. That's a part of the archetypical makeup of being men. And um, it's very powerful having a lady to serve with titles. Let me tell you, that brings out your very best. You're serving something which is a cause that is very worthwhile pursuing. Anyway, one of you know, her gardeners, of course they've got gardeners they've also got cleaners of course they do anyway um this is what i was trying to put everything together she's a worry ward sorry 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 and i'll be like oh, 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 oh. don't apologize please you have never done anything wrong and i could never figure out why these people are so tetchy about the word sorry they are traumatized they have got the worst 
doormat on them and they ultimately are running with trauma that's been there since childhood and um, all they know is how to submit and what's the best way to submit sorry so I just you know hands up sorry so yeah crawling out like just I, I hate seeing that man anyway um so it turns out that's why um my lady employs these people because they're lovely she likes to give those people a fair go and just that's the bullshit problem in this world right there and this is something that all empaths are going to have to work their way through and it's not easy to find the courage to do that and hey I've been looking for this answer for 15 16 years and like it kept fleeting past us until now so obviously I was meant to grab it I'm not talking about how do we become apologetic what I am saying though is we must find the balance of when it when we should be apologizing and when there's no need to that's the key there if we've done nothing wrong we should be not sorry for a thing being sorry is how we keep our ego deflated but um it's kind of like it's the the plug and we've ripped it out and it's an open sink and it's just empty we have no pride we've got nothing we've got no sense of self so apology and sorry and you know um submission and subservience and surrender and all that type of stuff that's how we empty ego um so if you're looking to begin to develop a healthy sense of self there's the door into beginning to get to that next step stop saying sorry all the time and you'll be like sorry i didn't mean it's just like there it is sorry i didn't mean to do this so so, so there is a story that we have going on in our subconscious. There it is. You know I was saying at the beginning of the walk, we'll figure it out. It's a belief, right? So let's walk through the rewiring of the belief. Let's go and sit up here where I've mowed the lawn and um, we'll get this dealt with. So, see, I feel like yeah, I'm quite a capable human and I was always gonna figure this stuff out and maybe that's why I went through it, because if I was going to figure it out and get the tools and skills for it, I could help someone else. All right. Oh, it's lovely up here being mowed, except for all the bloody grass clippings. All right. Um, narratives. A narrative is a storyline which creates a repetition. So sorry people that are always sorry they'll keep they're just in a loop you know it's just a a record that's over and over and over it's madness right how do you break the loop change the story so in a story you have the character you have the story itself and you have the outcome so the character could be my name is john smith the story could be that um Every time that I communicate with people, I feel that I stuff up and the outcome is I'm left feeling I need to apologize. What a terrible story to be running in the subconscious. You couldn't really have much lower a level than that running. That is Satan taking the most high and putting it right beneath his feet. That's, yeah, that, that, that's sitting in the pits of shame and you know just just rejection and just sabotage it's just horrible anyway so let's run with a new story so you might go look again my name's john smith and instead of feeling like i have stuffed up and the outcome being that i feel the need to apologize which is disempowering my name is john smith and um i'm not a bad person 
and I don't mean to do anything wrong. So when I have my say and part in a conversation, I am content with who I am as a human and I feel no need to apologize. But if I do make a mistake, I will take responsibility for my own actions and make the amends. What you have just done there is backed it off and come into central equilibrium. I really hope someone grabs this. I hope Jesus pushes this out to people who need this so that we can start to find the balance where the submissive, subservient, flog dogs with frigging doormats on you, just it, it's time for the doormat to go. The doormat is a story that's running in our subconscious and it's, it's time to rewrite our story. It's time to reinvent who we are. So to reinvent this one, if you find yourself, if you find yourself being overly apologetic, no more. You need to so remember it's the character, it's the story, it's the outcome. Get a pen and paper and write that down. It's the character, your name, it's the story, what happens with you. And then it's the outcome. What is the outcome of what happened with you? Take a look at it and just be transparent about it. Write it however you want to write it, swear words or whatever else. Just get it rough on the paper. Come as you are. Just, just exactly what it is. Write the story down. You, the story, the outcome. And then take the time to think about what would you prefer the story to be? rewrite who you are rewrite the story of your experience this is how we create a new identity so back off the need to be so apologetic it's pointless being unapologetic you don't need to be narcissistic about your own actions thinking that you have to be right all the time but it's all right to be convicted it's all right to have valor it's all right to be committed to your thoughts it's pointless being opinionated. You really want to have points of view based upon pragmatic evidence. All right? So we're just talking about um, when we toil with things, we want to produce a healthy case to bring forward. Anyway, so stop saying sorry so much. Apologize if you've done wrong by taking responsibility, but that doesn't need to be a part of your identity anymore. Let's liberate you from this subservience and give you a fresh start in creating a new story. Who are you? I'm John Smith. What is the story now? I am a convicted human being that has a pragmatic case to put forward in the conversations that I have. The outcome being that I feel happy loved and I enjoyed the experience and I look forward to doing it again if I make a mistake I will apologize but until then in the bin and what I would do to really sink this one home is the original story that you wrote down do it with pen and paper burn it get rid of it call Jesus Christ to come in and just take it out of your psyche get rid of it um, and the tool that I've given you here with the character, the narrative, the outcome, that's how you rewrite your identity as a human. And it's going to take a good period of time to do it. As you find within yourself, as you find within your character things that you do that don't feel right, write it down in that context, the character, the narrative, the outcome, change it, write a new one, and just it's going to take years essentially. But you've got nowhere but now to start. And it's a very simple tool, but this is the tool. Um, we are, see, our sense of self, our sense of self-worth, our identity. Our identity is the character that we play as a role with who it is we are in this experience. As a soul, we have no identity. So we get to choose the character we want to be in this life. So if you're not happy where you're at, start to rewrite the narrative. We've all got to run with a narrative. Um, I've been doing this for years and my narrative is fantastic and the life that I live is um, no less than sensational. It's got its ups and downs and it's got its trials, but I really do live 
a very healthy life. And I would really, um, I say like trying to sell God here, trying to sell Jesus and the Holy Spirit here. I would really, really, really emphasize the need to get good with God, really emphasize the need to follow God's plan for your life because it may surprise you what God has awaiting for you. Um, not even a lifetime worth of lottery wins comes close to what it is I had, what, what I walked into as my opportunity. God has an opportunity waiting for you. Do the hard work. Stay consistent. It will show up. It's going to take a few years to show up, but God needs to prepare you to be ready for who it is you need to be to be able to take full advantage of what that opportunity is. God has an opportunity for you. Start to rewrite your story. Become the unforgettable best version of yourself. And be a champion. Audio. Have a good day. Bye for now.